The early days of naval aviation were a time of experimentation in a lot of ways. From how to design a carrier, to how to make safe landings, and everything in between. In the United States Navy, meanwhile, another question entirely came up. How do you make sure your pilots are landing on the right carrier? A layman might think that this isn't that big of an issue, because how could a pilot land on the wrong ship? The thing is, though, it's surprisingly easy to get mixed up when ships look identical to each other and you're heading for a postage stamp on the ocean. This gets even more problematic if you're tired, if you're fighting a damaged plane, or just plain focusing more on the process of landing instead of looking for fine details. The solutions the Navy came up with will be the topic of this video, a short one intended as an experiment. With the busy part of the year coming back up, this could give me options if I lack the time to do longer form videos. That said, here we go. This issue of pilots landing on the wrong ship was one that the Navy, ship handlers or aviators, were caught a bit flat-footed by. When the only aircraft carrier was USS Langley, this wasn't something that anyone had to worry about. Can't very well land on a different ship if you only have the one option. However, when USS Lexington and Saratoga entered service, it suddenly became a very real problem. These two ships were functionally identical aside from minor differences in railings. That made it very, very easy for a pilot to mess up when landing. It was such a minor difference that it was extremely easy to miss. Of course, in peacetime, landing on the wrong ship could be laughed off with a joke or two. During wartime, however, it could very quickly become no laughing matter, especially if it broke up formations at a critical moment. As a direct result, the Navy decided to create a much more visible way to tell the ships apart. It was sometime between March and August 1929 that one of the ships got a new paint job. Saratoga got her famous black stripe down the middle of her stack. Lexington, meanwhile, seems to have had the black stripe around the top of her stack since the moment she entered service. This change did help lower confusion between the sisters, though it wasn't perfect. Fairly soon after the stripes were added, another change was made to the carriers. At the stern of their flight deck, they had their nickname painted in large letters, Lex and Sarah, respectively. While less immediately visible, because of photos generally not showing it, this change endured alongside the smokestacks. It seems to have been a successful change, too, as Enterprise in Yorktown would do the same thing when they entered service. Though in their case, it was EN for Enterprise, and YKTN for Yorktown. This isn't surprising, considering the same issue that had plagued the older conversions would have happened with the purpose-built carriers. Enterprise in Yorktown had different bridge structures, but a pilot wouldn't really notice that especially since they approached from the stern, where they looked basically identical, to land. Whereas having the name of the carrier plastered on the stern, or a nickname in this case, worked rather better. Of course, in wartime, this paint, be it the flight deck or the stack, vanished in short order. Camouflage soon took its place. A legacy of this was still visible during the war years, however, and I don't mean the Lex nickname making a brief return on CV-16. No, I mean that on both the surviving pre-war carriers, and the war-built ones, the number of the ship was painted on the flight deck, though it varied from ship to ship, and on when a picture was taken, on where the number was located. Sometimes it was just the bow, other times just the stern, and sometimes it was both the bow and stern. Regardless, this was still a way to tell apart otherwise identical ships from the air. This particular thing, though limited to the bow, continue through the Cold War and into the modern day. I'm unaware of the British doing similar things with their carriers during World War II, though I would be unsurprised if they did. That said, during the Korean War, they did adopt the put a distinctive marking on the flight deck system. As for Imperial Japan, they would put kanji on the flight deck to differentiate between ships, shown here with Shokaku and Zuikaku. That, however, went away during the war. Unfortunately, or fortunately, if you like funny pictures, even all of these measures didn't prevent people from landing on the wrong ship. And it became something of a tradition to rib the unfortunate pilot for his mistake. By which I mean graffiti. 
Lots and lots of graffiti. If a plane landed on the wrong carrier, the crew of that ship would proceed to grab chalk, and sometimes paint, and put messages all over the pilot's plane. These would range from fairly minor ribbing to some really creative jokes. And, of course, in at least one case, the ultimate insult to a naval aviator, shown on screen now. Must be Air Force. Because every military on Earth has some level of inter-service rivalry, and no one likes being lumped in with the guys in the other branches. That said, while I think the coding a plane in graffiti thing has fallen off, pilots would certainly still get roundly mocked if they land on the wrong ship. It's just less likely these days with all the technology to make sure you're in the right place. And it's just plain being a rare occasion when two or more carriers of the same class are sailing together. Still, this is probably a problem that will never entirely go away. After all, you can throw all the technology and paint at a problem you want. Because human error will always remain human error. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.